during the 19th century, Britain rose to become the world's leading imperial power. But how did the growth of the British Empire impact upon domestic society back home? How did it influence the ways in which people thought about themselves and their country? Did the empire provide Britons with a shared sense of national purpose and unite the disparate strands of society in a common imperial enterprise? By 1815, Britain had the skeleton of the great empire that was to develop during the 19th and 20th centuries. It had the remnants of its first great North American empire in modern-day Canada and a foothold in Australasia. It also had an increasingly important economic stake in the Indian subcontinent and was beginning to acquire territory in the Far East. Ceylon and the Cape had been taken from the Dutch and there were stations on the West African coast, possessions in the Caribbean and a scattering of other islands across the world. But compared to the empire of later years, it was still relatively small. This fledgling empire underwent an astonishing transformation during the course of the 19th century. By the early 1860s, Britain was ruling over roughly 175 million people. At its absolute peak, just after the First World War, the empire contained somewhere in the region of 450 million imperial subjects, roughly a quarter of the world's population. Canada had been fleshed out. Australia and New Zealand had developed dramatically. Huge territories had been acquired in Africa. The whole of the Indian subcontinent, in one way or another, was now blocked in in red. Britain had taken over Burma and acquired a substantial Southeast Asian empire based on Malaysia and Singapore. It had become the largest empire in human history, but one that contained a bewildering array of parts protectorates, protected states, condominiums, crown colonies, all sorts of territory taken over to facilitate the Royal Navy, the Indian Empire, self-governing colonies, and eventually dominions, all of which had their own patterns of acquisition, forms of rule, and relationships to the mother country. This formal empire was by no means all of Britain's sphere of influence during the 19th century. Often at least as important as the places actually coloured pink on the map were countries that, although technically independent, were under such a degree of British influence that terms like informal empire or semi-colonies are thought appropriate. Places like Argentina and Chile, modern-day Iran and much else in the Middle East, and big chunks of East and Southeast Asia, all found themselves at one time or another part of a British world system. This tremendous overseas expansion had been driven by two great forces. The first was the trading and commercial motive, the making of profitable links with other parts of the world which only accelerated as industrial output increased during the course of the 19th century. The second was the unstoppable flow of emigrants from Britain, initially fleeing political or religious persecution, but later just seeking a better life. Economic migrants, we'd call them today, 
and they were to open up North America, Australasia and South Africa. From one perspective at least, that's what's most distinctive about the British Empire. The extent to which parts of it were to become colonies of settlement. That Britain, more than any other country in the world, exported people. On the one hand, there are powerful forces, economic, political, social, ideological, driving outwards from the centre, from London, towards imperial expansion. On the other hand, uh, this by no means always and necessarily dominates British policy making, British politics. Acquisitions of territory are sometimes uh, apparently almost reluctant when the economic and other advantages of interaction with far-flung parts of the world were preferably to be obtained without the expense, the trouble um, of actual conquest and formal political overrule. By no means each individual acquisition, each individual grab of a new bit of territory can be clearly and directly traced back to somebody in London saying, we want that. Indeed, sometimes the policy makers in London are saying, damn it, there is so much trouble on that particular frontier uh, as it stands that the only way we can get things under control, or indeed, quite often, especially in the late 19th century, the only way we can shut other potential imperialists out is to take physical, political control of it. I think it's more the case of the, of the British government picking up the pieces after some violent military clash around the next bend of the river or some failure to get, get, to get trade flowing in it through a particular area or settlers getting into trouble. Like, for example, the British government intervenes twice in the first half of the 19th century in the so-called Maori Wars in New Zealand. That's because settlers were actually pushing their luck. They were, they were taking land from the Maoris, they were having uh, physical clashes with the Maoris, which they couldn't handle. And eventually Britain, sort of reluctantly, I think, because Victorian governments are terribly keen not to spend too much money. Governments eventually do send support to places like New Zealand and, of course, South Africa eventually, and other various colonial outposts, when the interests of British people and British trade and British commerce is apparently threatened. But it's often following on from some sort of crisis. In some places, that's the dominant pattern, um, where existing or desired economic interests are already there and then political control follows. There are other cases, and this is true of much of tropical Africa, for instance, where the existing economic penetration is not great, it comes much more after imperial conquest that's happened for other reasons, and indeed often happens only quite late. Quite a lot of British Africa only really starts to be, quote, developed, or if you prefer, intensively exploited economically in the very last years of the colonial era. Leaving aside the settlement colonies and a quite significant British community based in India, in much of the so-called subject empire, when it came to ruling over these societies, very few Britons were actually directly involved. At the London end, it's mere handfuls of civil servants. Remember, both the colonial office and the separate India office for most of their careers are really very small government departments. As for the men on the spot, the proconsuls, the district officers and commissioners, etc., these again in most cases are very small elites, often an individual, uh, usually a very young man in fact, ruling over what might be hundreds of thousands of native subjects places that were 
coloured pink on the map over which the Union Jack was flying were not necessarily, especially not for much of the 19th century, really under effective British control. Local semi-autonomous power holders, local resistors often, uh, might well in many cases continue to have considerable power. Far more areas of what was supposed to be British-controlled imperial possessions were actually effectively still semi-independent than is often remembered. So that really effective British control is quite often later than is thought and very short-lived before the tides of independence started to flow. I worked out that for the middle of the 19th century, the number of actual governors of the empire, administrators, white people going out from Britain, uh, as opposed to non-white people they found on the spot, was usually only about 2,000. And I think, I mean, I don't know, but I think, you know, Hull City Council has probably got more than 2,000 people running it, which either means that Hull is particularly full of you know, rebellious natives and so forth and needs that number of people looking after them, or uh, the British Empire was really very lightly governed on the whole. In some colonised societies, recognising and seeking to work with, if you like, to prop up local aristocracies and monarchies and so on, is a very established mode of imperial rule. What's often called indirect rule. Keep the local potentate king, chief, emir, sheikh, raja, in place, on his throne, and you, the colonial administrator, the district officer, or whatever, be the power behind the throne. The thinking, of course, amongst other things, is that this is usually a cheaper and less resistance-provoking way of ruling a colony than a more direct interventionist kind of overrule. The ideological thing, or the romanticism as it's sometimes seen, of applauding aristocracies, whether they were Indian or Nigerian or whatever, just as if supposedly they were British aristocracies, can be overdone. There's a much more hard-headed calculation. Ruling through these people certainly saves money and may save blood, British blood. In the first half of the century, British power had expanded relatively unchallenged. Its main European rivals were much more concerned with consolidating land on the continent than they were in establishing colonies overseas. But Britain's dominant position was underpinned not by its superior military might, but by its overwhelming naval supremacy. Battleships could be sent to bombard a port, overawe a prince, or intimidate a local population without the need for large numbers of troops on the ground. It was, in a way, empire on the cheap. The British standing army was about a quarter of a million men. And if you scatter them around a global empire, which is roughly a quarter of the world, you know, they're going to be pretty thin on the ground. But the standing armies were, of course, there, um, particularly on the Indian subcontinent. The British were able to recruit very large numbers of Indians and deploy them all around the world. The only time they hesitated about that was in South Africa, due to the um, sensitivity, if you could put it that way, racial prejudice might be a better way of putting it, of the Afrikaner majority amongst the white population in South Africa. But elsewhere, Indians are sent off to crush the uh, emperor of Ethiopia. They're sent to open up territory in Southeast Asia. They protect the frontiers of India itself. And of course, when the war breaks out in 1914, they are sent in large numbers, even to the Western Front. The empire was a patchwork quilt of extraordinarily varied kinds of territory kinds of control and means of acquisition. Sometimes this involves treaties, Britain establishing things that are called, for instance, protectorates, where 
the fiction, and it is usually rather a fiction, is that the local people, or at least the local rulers, have invited the British in to protect them. But much more often than not, it involves violence. It involves conquest. Sometimes extreme violence. Sometimes, as early on in parts of the Americas, and much later in Australasia, it involves something at least close to genocide of indigenous peoples. No project as diverse and durable as the British Empire is ever likely to be drawing on a single cause. It's possible to identify particular groups within British society with a particular interest and investment in empire, which might be economic or emotional or both, or rather several different groups, which might well have different ideas of empire and rather different kinds of interest. Those who ran the empire, those at the very top, were drawn from the same sector of society as those who ran Britain back home, the public school educated upper classes. The expansion of the British public school system provided a steady stream of officials to man the outposts of an ever-expanding empire. Educated in the classics, their character formed in the rough and tumble of team sports, these men were trained to be a governing class and regarded their role within the colonies as such. I think there is still some tendency to look down on um, careers in, in, the, in the colonies as, as perhaps not quite Pucker, to use a colonial or Indian term. But that, I think, quite rapidly fades as the whole panoply and splendor of the empire in the 19th century is manifest. I mean, to, to end up ruling an Indian province is um, quite a remarkable thing. You might be ruling Bengal as a governor general, and you'd be ruling tens of millions of people, probably more than inhabit the British Isles. So these are not small jobs. The idea of progress and of imperial rulers as the embodiments of progress is certainly there and in some quarters and in some registers. It's very powerful. And this, I think, may well apply especially to the settlement colonies. The idea that these, that are Canada and Australia and New Zealand, are the greatest hopes for the global future the idea that they're creating new and better Britons, actually, is very potent. But there are countervailing tendencies as well. Some rulers of empire and enthusiasts for empire are actually explicitly backward-looking. It's a kind of archaism, a romanticism, looking to the wild frontier and wild, unspoilt natives Places where a man could still really be a man. There's a strong gender dimension to this. Uh, this is also a powerful element in British political beliefs and artwork. If you think of someone like Kipling, or perhaps even more, a Ryder Haggard, then this idea of the romance of the frontier, which is very much a romance of the archaic, the primitive, the unspoilt, the undegenerate, is also a really powerful thing. The empire was not simply an aristocratic construction, however. It also provided opportunities for the professional middle classes. Those doctors, lawyers, engineers and journalists struggling to find employment or advancement back home whilst colonial governors might embrace a rather romantic anti-capitalism, seeing their role within empire as that of protecting native societies from the destructive forces of modernity. <laughs> <laughs> 
the professional middle classes might see the problem the other way around. From their perspective, empire might be both an initiator and driver of social and economic progress, helping to bring backward African and Asian societies into the modern world. This wider sense of mission, of having something to offer the rest of mankind, was often reinforced by deeper religious convictions. Most of the population at this time viewed themselves as Christian, and the churches were influential forces in public life. Religious faith could and did summon believers to action, and many set sail from Britain with the aim of spreading the gospel throughout the empire and beyond. A drive to Christianize and convert supposedly savage or heathen peoples can certainly be seen and helps underpin imperial expansion and then support for empire. But religious groups can also quite often be sharp critics of empire and preach notions of universal equality before God, brotherhood and sisterhood, which are at least implicitly and potentially, and sometimes actually and sharply, critical of empire, or at least of particular modes and abuses of colonial rule. Whilst colonial rulers, the secular forces uh, of the imperial state, on their part, might well not feel friendly to missionary efforts at all. Perhaps especially in Muslim territories and Muslim majority colonies, Christian missions are very sharply discouraged and even banned in most cases. The fear, and it sometimes turns out to be a quite justified fear, is that Christian mission activity in Muslim territories is going to arouse opposition that might become violent anti-colonial opposition. When the Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston announced to Parliament in 1839 that the great object of the government in every quarter of the world was to extend the commerce of the country, he was merely reiterating the conventional wisdom. Just as the British administrative machine drew its strength from the revenues generated by overseas trade, so too commercial interests relied upon state support. Merchants, operating out of the major port cities of London, Liverpool and Glasgow, might seek protection from warships and pirates, the opening up of resistant markets, or help in securing a monopoly or a license to rule by charter. Financiers and bankers, shipping magnates and insurers, what one famous modern work of imperial history called gentlemanly capitalists, all relied upon a flourishing overseas trade, and in many cases, the expansion of colonial settlement. It has been suggested that this group in particular, with its aristocratic connections and culture, and access to the corridors of power, was able to wield a significant influence over the imperial policies of successive British governments. Whilst in theory, diplomacy and commerce might march in step, at the first sign of trouble, each followed quite different rules of engagement. Status, merit, honour and success were judged very differently in these two worlds. Lost battles might not break banks, but they could break governments. Trade monopolies made business sense, but political trouble. Conscripting semi-servile labour might lower commercial cost, but if discovered, could raise the home political temperature to boiling point. Within the empire itself, relations between government and business rather than being eased by a common sense of purpose, were often strained by conflicts of interest 
and a deep mutual distrust. Whilst businessmen might rage against the diplomatic ignorance of commercial realities, the wasteful expenditure of colonial administrations, or the petty ambitions of its officers, to the rulers of empire, these unofficial imperialists could display a complete lack of regard for the framework of order needed to make their commercial inroads possible. It was a grudging respect for each other's utility, not identity of outlook, that drove them into wary collaboration. Whilst many colonies were important for individual industries, both as sources of raw materials and as markets for manufactured goods. Perhaps surprisingly, the empire was not as central to the British economy as today we might assume. Even at its height, the empire took only a third of Britain's exports, with more goods always going to places not much read on the map. For the advocates of free trade, many of whom were prominent figures in industry and commerce, the very existence of the empire could be seen as economically problematic. Many people, especially amongst the middle classes, were convinced that free trade was in the best interests of both the British economy and the British people. For those like the great radical politician Richard Cobden, Free trade was about more than just Britain's national interest. It had wider global benefits for the rest of mankind. Not only would free trade bring the peoples of the world together to exchange goods and improve their lives mutually, it would also foster communication and understanding as well. It was a recipe for peace and prosperity. In this early uh, innocent period of free trade ideology. Uh, the belief was that uh, free trade would bring empires to an end. Uh, free trade was an alternative to empire, if you like. There's a famous speech by uh, Cobden in 1846, I think it is, when the Corn Laws were repealed, saying that the effect of this would be to wipe away great and mighty armies and empires and so on, so that everybody would live equally in the world, nobody dominated by anybody else, no national boundaries, certainly no imperialism at all. And this would be the result of a free trade, to wipe out empires. Around 50 years ago, there were two quite famous academic articles, one called The Imperialism of Free Trade uh, and one called The Anti-Imperialism of Free Trade. And both sets of historians were at least half right. Free traders were, on the whole, against aggressive imperialism as they saw it, new colonies, new conquests and acquisitions, but certainly not necessarily hostile to British control and dominance in existing spheres of influence. Free trade tends usually to be the preference of the powerful in global affairs. So it's arguable that free trade enthusiasm in mid-Victorian Britain reflects and itself furthers Britain's dominant global position at that time. Free traders, you could say, are very keen on informal empire, British domination, but preferably without the cost and the bloodshed of actually sending troops in, running the Union Jack up, etc., in far flung places. Whilst much of the empire was ruled by mere handfuls of mainly upper class Britons, Emigration to the so-called settlement colonies was clearly a mass phenomenon. Between 1815 and 1914, more than 22 million people left the British Isles for destinations overseas. Working class immigration was not neatly politically tied to empire and imperial expansion, however. If it had been, 
far fewer would have emigrated to the independent United States. In the first half of the century, people who emigrated abroad moved almost entirely because they had to. Still often viewed through the prism of transportation, emigration was seen as an alternative to the poorhouse, a last chance to rescue oneself from a life of poverty and destitution. From the 1840s and 50s, the colonies increasingly began to be portrayed and perceived, not as places for prisoners and paupers, but as lands of opportunity, where people might find a better life for themselves and their children. Emigration was to become an industry in itself, with an army of agents and propagandists keen to champion the greenness of the grass on their side of the world. Economic advancement was not the only motivation for migrants. There might be social and political reasons as well. South Australia, for example, had more liberal labour laws and introduced a working men's franchise much earlier than Britain. The prospect of living in a freer, more open society must have been a factor in some people's decisions to emigrate. Whether they were forced out by desperate circumstance or sought a life better than the one Britain could offer them, it's difficult to see how the reasons that led so many to set sail for the colonies can have encouraged a deep sense of patriotic pride in the country they were leaving. I think once they got there and had settled themselves in, I think they then became increasingly pro-British or pro-Empire because they felt that in the last resort, the empire would protect them from the indigenous people and would look after them in the face of the expansion. For example, the Australians became obsessed, if that's not too strong a word, towards the end of the 19th century by the fear of what was called the Yellow Peril, which was the um, irresistible uh, immigration to Australia of Chinese, impoverished Chinese, or the growing power of Japan, who on earth is going to protect the Australian colonies from this Yellow Peril if it's not the Royal Navy? So I think... Although lots of immigrants might have gone on thinking, oh, thank God we've got rid of the old country or have been driven out for their political views or their religious views or whatever it is, they increasingly find themselves part of an English-speaking imperial community of which Britain is the centre. I think the British imperialism was far stronger in places like um, Australia uh, and Canada and so on than it was in Britain. One little bit of evidence of this is that when the... Um, Empire Day movement came on, the, the movements have one day of the year which was celebrated as Empire Day. It was always rejected in Britain by politicians of, of both sides and it was first taken up in Australia and Canada and New Zealand and it was only instituted as Empire Day in Britain during the First World War. Before the so-called scramble for Africa, indeed before the scramble for territory in China, mid-Victorian Britain was already established as Europe's leading imperial power. Yet when Britain was put on display at the Great Exhibition of 1851, a very different story was being told. Unlike at previous national exhibitions, Half of the space within the Crystal Palace was given over to other countries and their industrial and technological achievements were displayed alongside those of Britain. Partly this was to demonstrate Britain's evident superiority in the field, but also to show that all peoples of the world could become as prosperous if they followed her examples of peace and free trade. The 1851 exhibition was not, first and foremost, an imperial celebration. One has to wait until well over half a century later 
to the Wembley Exhibition of 1924 to find an event that would fit that description. The colonies of course did figure though, and there were colonial sections that implicitly underlined the economic value of the empire, a message somewhat at odds with the overarching theme of pacifist internationalism. Yet when the exhibition came to an end, and the Crystal Palace was relocated to a permanent site in 1854, the Indian and colonial exhibits were not transferred, and the empire disappeared. One of the challenges for the historian of the 19th century who wants to understand the place and importance of the empire in Britain's private and public life is never just to look at the empire in isolation, but also always to look at the empire in its wider context. If you read the newspapers of the time at all levels, uh, that's from the Times down to, let's say, Reynolds' newspaper, not, not down in a qualitative way, but so far as the orders of society that they were directed at, you find that most attention is given to domestic affairs, in working class papers to murders and things like that, uh, and then to politics. The second most common subject of interest was European affairs, especially when very exciting things were going on in the continent in the 50s and 60s and 70s. Thirdly, in America, which was always very popular source of news for people in the 19th century, and only very lastly from the colonies. And it was only when there was a great crisis in one of the colonies, and the Indian Mutiny was one of these, that imperial affairs came on to the front page, or the equivalent of the front page, because very often 19th century newspapers you had advertisements on the front page. But anyway, I found looking at local papers in Hull, and it was usually local papers that people bought, that even when the mutiny was at its height, it usually came only about third or fourth in the order of priorities of news items. Um, you were tucked away in the bottom of the first page or whatever. It's often said that the Cambridge historian Sir John Seeley once claimed that the British had conquered and peopled half the world in a fit of absence of mind. Rather than trying to explain how it had been acquired, the point he was actually trying to make was that despite their country ruling over vast swathes of the globe, the wider population appeared largely indifferent to this great phenomenon. While we were doing it, he wrote, we did not allow it to affect our imaginations or in any degree to change our ways of thinking. Nor have we ceased to think of ourselves as simply a race inhabiting an island off the northern coast of the continent of Europe. Seeley's main complaint, though, was that historians, too, had failed to comprehend this tremendous expansion of geopolitical power. They remained fixated with parliamentary wrangling and agitations about liberty, and were thus unable to understand that the history of Britain was being written elsewhere. Whilst we might question Seeley's analysis of wider society, there is little doubt that the history books of the time echo the story being told about Britain at the Great Exhibition. Empire might appear, but only at the margins. The main themes in them, or theme, was the evolution of freedom in Britain. Britain's progress to domestic freedom as putting her above other nations, but there's no other kind of uh, imperial implication to it than that. That was the main thing that was taught to Britain, knowingly or not, which was supposed to be built into their sense of national identity, that they were a free people. And pride in the empire hardly appears at all. It is amazing how little there is about the empire. There could just be a few phrases about how Britain is bringing you know, the gospel to benighted Africans or something like that. Or there could be downright criticism of Britain's 
crimes in the past in stealing land from the Native Americans, for example, in North America. So it could go either way. It didn't seem to matter very much before about 1870s, 1880s. Back home in Britain, policymakers and statesmen were often much more concerned with the European balance of power than with anything else. It's often been said that there was nothing like a debate on India to empty the House of Commons. Most voters, still a minority of even adult men at this time, were concerned about domestic issues, bread and butter issues, economic and social questions. For the great majority, the empire remained a very remote thing in the mid-19th century. Working-class memoirs reveal lives of long hours, sparse leisure time, and a lack of access to the printed word. Not only was the empire far away, it often wasn't particularly relevant in lives lived by the passing of the seasons or the factory whistle. At a time when Britain was undergoing a period of tremendous economic growth and transformation at home, many people's horizons were very much fixed on finding their own way in their own world. Education for the great bulk of the population still remained extremely limited. Its value for all classes had been all but universally accepted by the 1840s, but there was almost equal agreement among the leaders of society that its primary function was to fit recipients for their proper station in life. When a Royal Commission examined schooling for the children of the labouring classes in 1858, it did so on the understanding that it should be cheap, efficient and not normally take children beyond the age of 11. The working classes did no history at all, full stop. There was none. So there was no imperial history. Uh, and there was virtually any geography. And any geography there was was generally just measuring up their own schoolyard. It wasn't thought to be a good thing for children that were just going to be seamstresses and, and farm workers and so on to know anything beyond their own village. If they did, they might become unsettled and discontented. The ordinary working man or woman might have been aware of the empire or a particular part of it through the opportunities it provided their branch of industry, perhaps through friends and family who had emigrated, or maybe through missionaries generating support for their cause back home in the churches and chapels. But such awareness was not necessarily accompanied either by detailed knowledge of or a particular enthusiasm for empire. And for much of the century, this situation didn't seem to particularly trouble those at the heart of the British state. Intense popular interest at home in the affairs of empire might well be disconcerting, destabilising for government and for the rulers of empire. Increased interest might mean unwelcome curiosity about the seamier side of what was going on in far-flung colonies. Increased interest or knowledge might mean increased criticism. Indeed, increasingly, as time went by, it seemed as though it did. Keeping a kind of insulation between the affairs of empire and the tides of public opinion at home was valuable and clearly often explicitly desired, at least some of the time. For much of the 19th century, Britain's settler colonies, the colonies that we now call Australia, New Zealand, and parts of South Africa and Canada were seen by many within Britain essentially as dumping grounds for the poor. Yeah. 
or perhaps places where disgraced minor aristocrats or buccaneering capitalists could go and make their fortune. They didn't feature particularly prominently in the British political imagination. There had been an attempt earlier in the century to try and give a more positive gloss to settler colonialism, with some success. But it was only really in the last three decades of the 19th century that settler colonies began to play a much more positive role in the way that many in Britain thought about the empire and world politics more generally. For some, the settlement colonies were merely a continuation of British society overseas. British ideas, values and institutions were simply being transposed from the so-called motherland to pastures new. For others, however, the colonies performed an almost utopian role. Whilst Britain was overcrowded, decaying, mediocre, a country of industrial slums and satanic mills, the frontiers of colonial settlement represented not just extensions of Britain, but a chance to create new forms of political community. This idea of a greater Britain, the British nation, or the British race as it was sometimes called, transformed into a global diaspora, engaged the imagination of those at both ends of the political spectrum. We have to remember that places like New Zealand and uh, Australia were far more progressive in many respects politically than Britain was itself. New Zealand, of course, most famously, is the first country in the world to give women the vote. The franchise was much more extensive in all of the colonies than it was in Britain. So for working men uh, in particular, for much of the century, the colonies actually looked an extremely friendly environment in which to be based. So it's not surprising that some political radicals and some socialists uh, did see Greater Britain as a space in which um, a more progressive and more egalitarian politics could be enacted and played out. And potentially even one in which the motherland itself, Great Britain, could be democratised from the colonies. So that if we link all the political communities together more closely, this might have positive political effects on Britain itself. So that was one line of argument. There were plenty of other socialists and radicals who fundamentally opposed Greater Britain, seeing it as the latest iteration of imperialism, seeing as it as, as negative in all sorts of different ways. So I don't want to suggest that there was a single socialist position on this, um, far from it. But nevertheless, there was quite significant support. Conservatives supported Greater Britain for very different reasons in many ways. Many of them saw the increasing democratisation of Britain, slow as it was, and we have to remember that it was incredibly slow, as a threat. A threat in all sorts of ways, a threat to establish privileges and hierarchies at home, but also as a threat to the empire itself. And so one of their fears was that by giving ever-increasing numbers of men the vote, of course still very little thought at the time, amongst the dominant elites at least, of giving women the vote, but the thought was that if we give increasingly large numbers of working men the vote, they will vote against empire. They will look after their own interests, and that will typically involve them either becoming or being ambivalent about empire or being actively opposed to it. And so therefore, um, it's important to try to create a Greater Britain which nullifies or reduces this possibility. And one way of doing that is to support systematic emigration from the cities. Many at the time saw the industrial slums of Britain's great cities as the threat, as breeding grounds for potential socialists. By encouraging and perhaps funding emigration of many poor city dwellers to the colonies, their radical politics could be neutralised. It was hoped that the transformation of their environment, the conditions under which they lived, would transform their political views the alienated urban working class would become rugged, virtuous settlers. Great Britain was a very loose term. It was an umbrella under which lots of different uh, people could travel and proselytise their own particular political visions. It's one of its strengths, on the one hand, because it allowed for all kinds of alliances between people that might otherwise disagree, 
but ultimately it was also one of its weaknesses because as it happens people did end up disagreeing pretty heavily on what exactly Greater Britain was and therefore what needed to be done to bring it about or to secure it. At one end of the spectrum you might say there was an incredibly vague and amorphous notion where Greater Britain just referred to the collection of peoples who regarded themselves as British in one way or another and who happened to be spread throughout different communities around the world. People who supported this vision were keen to maintain connections of one kind or another with British emigrants in Australia and New Zealand. They wanted them to be recognised more positively and they wanted them to be involved in all sorts of sort of economic and cultural transactions, but it didn't really involve much more than that. And at the other end of the spectrum, there are those that saw Greater Britain as potentially a global federal state in the making. Most enthusiasts for Greater Britain were somewhere in the middle of these two positions. They were keen to further develop political links between Britain and the settler colonies, but tended to shy away from more radical plans that proposed a federal structure to coordinate the different parts of this new political community. Much as they might have wanted to see a new transoceanic state, they recognised that it was deeply unrealistic within the current political culture and therefore opted for much less ambitious plans. Technology played a fundamental role in all of these different conceptions of Greater Britain. So whether you were a radical federalist or whether you believed simply in moderate tinkering with the existing structure, the fact that new communications technologies allowed communication across great distances instantaneously meant that a sense of community, a sense of belonging, could be utilised to reinforce the sense of Britishness. So whereas in the 18th century and for much of the 19th century, it would take weeks, possibly months, to communicate with people by letter who were across the oceans, by the time the electrical telegraph reached from Britain to these outposts of empire, communication was near enough instant. And this was seen to fundamentally transform the conditions of politics. It allowed people to imagine themselves as part of a single political community. Of course, many of the people who are populating Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, and so on and so forth, are emigrants from Britain. So they already have very strong connections with the motherland. And this just serves to reinforce them. It allows them to maintain contact with their families and friends back home. It allows them to read newspapers the day after they were printed in London. It allows them to share in the rituals of national identity and so on and so forth. So there's no doubt that it reinforces an existing set of national affiliations to Great Britain. But at the same time there are complex currents of settler nationalism emerging within the colonies. Now nationalist historians of Australia, New Zealand, Canada and so on tended to see this as in significant tension with or as an antithesis to Britannic nationalism so that you get the emergence of a distinct Australian national identity which is defined partly in opposition to being part of the British Empire. And that may well happen much, much later in the history of empire, during the middle decades of the 20th century, say. But during the closing decades of the 19th and the early decades of the 20th century, these two forms of affiliation went hand in hand. They weren't in tension. You could be simultaneously a proud Australian and a member of the wider British diaspora. There were, of course, minorities within the settler colonies. The French-speaking Quebecois in Canada, or the Irish in Australia, for example, who were either deeply ambivalent about, or resistant to, attempts to impose or deepen a sense of Britishness. Even so, within these populations, there was occasional support for being at least part of a grand imperial structure. The flexibility of the idea of Greater Britain, its lack of a precise definition, stimulated considerable debate about who was included in or could become part of this family of Britishness. There is, for instance, great ambiguity and disagreement about whether the United States is or should be part of that Greater Britain, that Anglo-sphere uh, or Britishness. 
Again, sometimes at the time, often at the time, a racialized language of Anglo-Saxonism is used. So for some people, the United States is or should be part of that global family of Britishness. For some people, the quote Anglo-Saxon Germans ought to be invited into it. Remember that Cecil Rhodes, when he established the scholarships in Oxford that were going to perpetuate his name, originally included German as well as American and British colonial students in the scheme. There's lots of doubt and ambiguity and dispute about whether Ireland and the Irish really belong to the family or not. And fascinatingly, though more at the margin, about whether non-white subjects of the empire might be or might in future become really part of the family. The intensely racialized discourse of so much public life in that time tended to proclaim or assume that they weren't, they couldn't be. This was a whites only affair, as in its origins really the Commonwealth was. But you do get significant numbers, especially amongst educated elites in most obviously the Caribbean, uh, but also in Western Southern Africa, in Bengal and elsewhere, saying, no, we are British too. We are part of this greater Britain. We are part of this family. And we demand the rights that come from membership in the family. In the early part of the 19th century, the idea that Britain had a duty to communicate to those subject to its rule, the blessings and benefits of the European condition, held a wide currency. Britain's imperial purpose, it was argued, was not simply the grubby pursuit of profit, but rather a commitment to bring light into the darkest corners of the world. Britain had to embrace the responsibilities of empire, to which it had been called by providence. These wider global commitments found expression in the missionary movement abroad and the anti-slavery campaign at home, both underpinned by the belief that the great mass of mankind could and would be transformed. I think Evangelical Christianity has an important impact on uh, attitudes towards race. And I think there is a the first half of the 19th century um, attitude which is um, in some ways idealistic and also rather unrealistic. I think there is the hope that as they, the other, black and brown others, become subject to British rule, uh, civilizing mission, the impact of Christianity, they will um, gradually, somehow, by some magic, turn into brown and black Englishmen and women. I think there's an enormous evangelical hope that that will happen. The sort of high point of universalist thinking, of the kinds of thinking which was, you know, we are all, we are all the same, we can all become the same, and what underpinned that was that every, everybody can become like us. I mean, that was really what was imagined in the abolition campaigns. You know, we are brothers under the skin and the skin doesn't matter. But the skin did matter. And the, the problem is that after emancipation, when it became clear that emancipated Africans were not going to fit quite as easily into a picture of industrious, you know, hard-working, domesticated men and women, which was what the abolitionists had imagined, then a sense of disappointment, a sense of economic failure, uh, arguments begin to emerge about how emancipation hasn't worked, you know, it's an experiment that hasn't worked. And what goes with that is new ways of articulating the differences between peoples that can no longer rest on 
you know, the problem is slavery, now there has to be something else. So the problem is, you know, the problem is civilization, the problem is, you know, these forms of barbarism which are still there. And they are, of course, associated also with skin and bones and hair and all those things. So there's a, there's a physical aspect to it. But I don't think that, I don't think that biological notions of race are the key to it. I think that it's a civilizational index which is really critical. Abolitionists were increasingly on the defensive over the question of emancipation in the West Indies. Those public men who had always opposed the abolition of slavery now became more forthright in their opinions. Events in the Caribbean demonstrated, it was claimed, the essential inferiority of black people. They were born to be mastered and had only been briefly lifted out of barbarism by their enforced enslavement and encounter with Europe. Whilst the empire's white subjects might be capable of self-government, those colonies with substantial black populations were not. Those optimistic, progressivist, and for that matter, arrogant British ideas about how empire was going to develop were dealt a further blow by a series of events in the colonies. The so-called Indian Mutiny of 1857 and the Morant Bay Rebellion in Jamaica in 1865, both dramatic rejections of British authority, forced missionaries and their supporters to recognise that colonial rule was not a simple matter at all. The empire's non-white subjects were perhaps less men and brothers, but rather children who needed responsible and at times forceful parents. Although there was no doubting Britain's civilizational superiority, the extent to which British rule could transform, however gradually, the races or peoples under its care was a contested issue. Let us take the Negro as we find him, announced the speaker at a meeting of the Anthropological Society of London in 1866. As God designed him, not a white man, nor the equal of a white man. For those who believed all peoples were the descendants of Adam and Eve, the differences between races could be explained by differences in culture and climate. This didn't mean that all were equal, but given the chance and the right conditions, the level of civilization attained by European culture might be reached by all. At the same time, there were those who focused on ideas of permanent physical difference and inherited characteristics to explain the fundamental differences between peoples. These two discourses on race, that of cultural differentialism and that of biological racism, were both used to uphold racial hierarchies that progressed from savagery to civilization and ultimately featured white Anglo-Saxons at their apex. They were perhaps not two different systems, but rather racism's two registers. There's no doubt that various scientific developments during the 19th century feed into a set of arguments about race. The argument can be overstated, however. Um, there are lots of different factors go into making racial arguments. And evolutionary claims post-Darwin can be used for completely contradictory and conflicting political visions. So, for example, you've got social Darwinists who thought that the main lesson that could be learned from Darwin's work was that the races of the world are going to end up in perpetual conflict with one another and that uh, the strongest would win out in the long run. Deeply pessimistic, racist, um, competitive view could also be used to support unfettered capitalism and a variety of other social practices and institutions. At the same time, you had people like Prince Kropotkin, anarchists, arguing that the lesson to be learned from evolution was that human harmony 
was natural and that cooperation was what uh, was ordained by nature. So even if we take the lessons that were drawn from evolution, they're politically indeterminate and conflicting. Scientific developments certainly played a role, but not for everyone. You didn't and don't need to believe in an evolutionary theory to be a racist. Ideas of racial hierarchy had existed prior to the 19th century, but had been supported by philosophical and religious rather than scientific arguments. The growth of pseudo-scientific racial theories were tributaries that fed into an existing stream of racial thinking in the later 19th century and gave it new form. There's no doubt that at least some people, including some very prominent people, did think that science now legitimated views about race and human society. Science has huge cultural authority. It does now and it did then. And to be able to make arguments about social life, and in particular ones about the relations between peoples, between cultures, and to dress this in a language of science, is to make a very powerful ideological claim. One that is extremely effective in shaping the way that people think about the nature of the world. The idea that certain races, certain groups of people, were living, expanding communities, whilst others were failing, dying ones, could and did shape relationships between coloniser and colonised. In Australia, most strikingly, interaction with Aborigines was often underpinned by a grim, self-consoling conviction that it didn't matter too much how these people were being treated, because they're a race doomed to die out anyway. Although the belief in the essential unity of mankind still remained a powerful one for some people, by the end of the 19th century, the negative representation of other races or peoples as inferior to white Britons could be found in many different cultural forms. If you look at the outpouring of children's literature, the books for boys, books for girls, in the latter part of the 19th century, they almost always back that line up. So do school textbooks, by the way. They back the line up that black and brown people, particularly black people, are inherently um, inferior, more or less incapable of improvement, that they will um, sort of hobble around in the lower depths of colonial society and they will do some menial jobs and they will be useful but they can never really aspire to the heights reached by white men and women. And that's probably beyond their capability. And that is, I think, a, a sort of a, an unspoken understanding which gains enormous currency through literature for children, liter literature for grown-ups even. Look at John Buchan's, a lot of John Buchan's writing towards the end of the 19th, 30, 20th century, in which Jews and blacks and other people are sort of written off as, um, well, inferior, basically. And I think that seeps into society. School textbooks talk about the hopeless delinquency of the freed slave in the Caribbean. They, you know, they just write people off. And I think that has a drip, drip impact on um, young people being educated because from 1870, after the Forced Education Act, almost every child is educated at least up to the age of 11 or 12. That wasn't happening before. And they're being subjected often. Uh, they may have liberal teachers, but the school textbooks are frequently illiberal. In the second half of the 19th century, members of the British political elite began to feel increasingly threatened by the rise of competing great powers. Whilst Germany and Russia presented a military challenge to British imperial supremacy, with Germany especially being very keen to develop its own colonies, along with the United States, they were also serious economic rivals. It began to be argued, particularly from the 1870s onwards, that perhaps free trade was not in Britain's best interests after all. Perhaps Britain's economic future might ultimately lie 
in a stronger, more unified empire, and a series of privileged arrangements with its colonies. In a more threatening world, empire increasingly came to be seen both as a unit of mutual defence and as a unit of mutual economic development. Up until this point, the empire in general hadn't cost the British Exchequer very much. One of the key rules of the imperial administration had been that the colonies should be, to a large degree, self-sufficing. When a new India office was built in London in the 1860s, for example, it was paid for by Indian, not British taxpayers' money. But if the expense or demands of empire were to rise, would the public at large be willing to go on footing the bill? There were certain strands within both the Liberal and Conservative parties that were fearful of a turn against empire. They were worried there was a growing perception that the burdens now outweighed the benefits. Or perhaps worse, that the benefits of empire were accrued by the privileged classes, whilst the burdens were borne by the rest of society. There's something called the new imperialism, which is really a, an attempt to put empire at the centre of the British political agenda and to make not merely the uh, ruling elites aware of it, because they already are aware of it, but making the working man aware of it. And I think the idea of empire is promoted towards the end of the 19th century with more passion and zeal by people like Chamberlain and, and Milner and Curzon and a whole host of other people, because they also see it as an alternative to the um, rapid development and advance of socialism, even communism, egalitarianism. If they can get the British working man hooked on the idea of empire, being profitable, a provider of jobs, a source of glory, a source of self-satisfaction, the hope is that these people will not join trade unions, become Bolsheviks and overthrow the ruling order. We see in the second half of the 19th century, in the later Victorian and Edwardian period, the growth of a whole array, one might even say army, of propagandist leagues and societies and fringe and ginger groups who either are promoting particular imperial agendas, emigration to the empire, imperial naval supremacy, tariff reform, whatever it may be, or there to promote the empire as a concept and the virtues and values of empire more broadly. It, it took all sorts of forms. So speaking tours, lecture tours by prominent colonial politicians or by advocates of imperialism, design of school textbooks, creation of Empire Day, the design and propagation of all sorts of memorabilia, paraphernalia to do with the empire, just a general set of strategies for encouraging a sense of belonging within an empire as opposed to a much more local or national frame of reference. It was then that those maps of the world with the British possessions coloured in red came into English schoolrooms. They never had been before then. The empire was never colour-coded before about 1880, and it doesn't come into schoolrooms until the 1900s, put there by propaganda organisations like the Navy League uh, and so on, in order to encourage this kind of imperial patriotism. By the end of the 19th century, the empire was much more likely to be part of the fabric of the average Britain's daily life than it had been in 1850. Whether in terms of one's economic well-being, the food one ate or the clothes one wore and where they came from, or where people in the armed forces had been sent, where one's friends and family lived, where letters were going to and from. Whether looking at elite levels or more popular culture, there's a huge range of cultural artefacts either about the empire or with an explicitly pro-imperial message. But it's been pointed out by more skeptical observers at the time and since that this was almost never the dominant theme in any genre of advertising, music, literature, children's comics, or even early cinema. But does this greater imperial cultural presence point to a deeper commitment to 
and belief in empire amongst the population at large. Had the British become an imperial people? What we know about imperial propaganda, notwithstanding the fact that it's been very well and very widely studied over the last 20 years, is how much of it there was, how varied the forms that it took, how energetic and active people were in peddling and promoting it. What is still much harder for us to establish is precisely what effects that it actually had. We know, and it's relatively easy to know, a lot about the production of such images, of what was put out, whether it's in children's comics or in popular novels or in the music hall or on biscuit tin lids. We know far less, and we can, in the very nature of things, know far less about how it was received, how it was consumed. People bought the biscuit tins, they ate the biscuits, the people who are designing the biscuit tin lids might want to propagandise for empire. But how can we know who and how the pictures of red coats or faithful Indian servants on those tin lids were looked at? Did they influence anyone politically? Extraordinarily hard to say. The efforts of imperialists to educate and inform, testified not to their confidence in the imperialism of the masses, but to their fears of indifference or even downright hostility. One must unfortunately explain to these damn fools, wrote a despairing Milner of his audiences in 1906, why we want an empire. If the records of policy making are any guide, Mass enthusiasm for empire building, whether spontaneous or manufactured, was fleeting at best. People get excited about the empire in moments of crisis, whilst in routine times there is comparatively little media coverage, comparatively little artistic and other cultural production that's obviously and directly empire related, apparently comparatively little popular interest. There's really not one British general election across the whole of modern history that's fought, won and lost, mainly on imperial questions. And when opinion surveys started to come into play, which is only well into the 20th century, of course, we find that most people, most of the time, are quite staggeringly ignorant about the empire. Doesn't mean they don't care, especially when there's a crisis. But it's a fairly loose, broad, vague kind of caring. Often a sort of extension of a more generalised patriotism and quite hard, often, analytically or politically, really clearly to distinguish what's distinctively imperial from what's a more generalised patriotism or nationalism or even what one critic about a hundred years ago famously called jingoism, a particularly aggressive and perhaps mindless kind of patriotism. Consent is crucial. Consent is different, I think, from uh, somebody necessarily being very knowledgeable about the empire. It might even be different from someone feeling, in the normal run of things, very committed to it. It's certainly different from someone feeling necessarily that they're emotionally attached to empire. What it means is there is enough level of support there, enough acquiescence, if you like, because that's all you need, anything more is better, is a bonus for a body of opinion uh, not to develop that is overtly critical of or antagonistic to empire. So until you, you actually had the British taxpayer um, having to pay an awful lot of money for this sort of thing, 
and and as soon as you got conscripted men uh, 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 in the army, which you never had before 1916, uh, then it caused a problem. It caused a problem in particular when Britain was trying to police Iraq around about 1920, or Mesopotamia, it was called then, and she was trying to uh, control it with conscripted soldiers who had been um, called up in order to f defend hearth and home in the First World War and now found they're going to have to defend the bloody empire and they mutinied. And secondly, by middle class taxpayers in the House of Commons who formed a new party in order to oppose colonial expenditure. So as long as, as it didn't cost either lives or money, or involuntary lives, let's say, or money, uh, th then, then it wasn't particularly troubling, this situation. By seeking to make people more aware of the empire, propaganda could even have the opposite and undesired effect of increasing hostility towards it. It's perhaps no coincidence that we see a more overt and explicit anti-imperial movement, developing at a time when the empire is being promoted more vociferously than ever before. There's a very strong, I think, explicit anti-imperialist movement that starts off in the very late 1890s, uh, culminates probably in the great sort of original work of anti-imperialism by John Atkinson Hobson called Imperialism of Study, published in 1902, which became the foundation of uh, what later became the Marxist theory of imperialism, attributing, in other words, imperialism to the overproduction of capital and goods. That certainly in labour and socialist movements in the, in the 1900s and then in the 1920s and 1930s becomes really quite powerful. Uh, and so powerful, I think, I mean, not powerful enough to actually bring the empire to an end, but effective more in getting the imperialists themselves to modify the image they like to give of their imperialism. So that in, again, school textbooks after 1918, you get very little about conquest and battles with natives and everything and so on. And the empire is seen much more as a kind of consensual thing, a kind of big club, a proto-United Nations that everybody originally had asked to join, you know, please could we join your empire, uh, and, and loved and played cricket and so on. And, and, and that aspect of it, you know, the present Commonwealth ideal was born there and became the dominant theme, I think because of this anti-imperial criticism from the 1900s onwards, which of course seemed to be justified uh, by this explanation of the First World War as being the result of competing imperialisms. The tremendous growth of Britain's empire was not on the whole underpinned by a corresponding commitment to it amongst the great mass of the population. For much of the century, even when imperial expansion was at its most rapid, the empire often appears only at the margins of public and private life. Somewhat paradoxically, imperial themes in formal education and popular culture were at their most pervasive in the late stages of empire between the world wars, when it's supposedly in terminal decline, rather than at its height in the late 19th century. But even those Britons who had a particular interest in or attachment to empire were not necessarily united by a shared view of it, or moved by motives that we can identify as distinctively imperial. On the one hand, we have an increasingly diverse and pluralistic British society. On the other, a diverse and pluralistic empire. And if you put the two together, the almost inevitable consequence is that British society is going to engage with and respond to empire in many different ways. The empire survived for so long not because all those caught up in it bought into a shared perspective or set of values, 
a common imperial British identity. But because different people at different times could see in the empire a space to realise their own goals and ideals for themselves or their country, perhaps for mankind. And these could all to some extent be satisfied.